Hi everyone and welcome to this new series on chess. Uh, a few words first about the purpose of this channel and then the name of the series. A chess commentator once said that chess is so beautiful that it's totally worth wasting your entire life with it. And I agree, however to me the question rather is not whether chess is beautiful enough to waste your life with it, but how to become a strong player without wasting your life during the process. Um, what do I consider a strong player? If we look at some stats on Lee Chess, uh, a rating of uh, 2200 or 2200 means that you are in the 99th uh, percentile, which means that you are better than 99% of all the players. So basically, out of 135,000 people this week, um, only how many? Only 460 players have made it past this mark, which is which is a in, incredibly small number based on the total number of players. Um, the most obvious conclusion is that there is something, or or rather many things, that these people um, know about chess and are able to incorporate in their game that these people can't. The below the 2200 players. So the goal of this series is to explain through many examples and live blitz games played on the internet, what sets apart the stronger player from the weaker player. And funny enough, and at least to me, no satisfactory and widely accepted answer to that question exists in chess literature and, el and elsewhere. And if you ask 100 players above 2200 or 2300 how they made it to this rating and in what way exactly are they better than they were when they were, say, 1800, 1900, not only they might not be able to tell you simply because they do not remember or simply don't care, but you will also get a hundred different answers which to everyone um, of them would be a valid answer and they would be a valid answer in their own right. So first of all, why is it so difficult to get past um, 2200 rating in chess splits or any other form of chess, classical or otherwise? Well, simply because when you get to the 1900s, um, you get to play with some people that have studied the game all their life, have read tens of books of chess, um, and play several hours per day. So how exactly do you beat someone like that? And well, how exactly do we approach the question of studying in chess? What do we need to study and need to know best? Is it openings? Is it the middle game? Is it end game? Is it tactics? Is it strategy? Is it open positions, closed positions? Um, planning, technical chess, and so on. Each of these subjects can be subdivided into others. So what is it really that sets apart the higher rated player from the lower rated player? Well, in my opinion, there are six reasons or six aspects of chess that the stronger player understands at a much higher level and is able to utilize in their games and win consistently because of that. Um, I have listed them here in the order of importance. Number one, dynamic chess, or this is understanding the dynamic elements of chess, which are initiative, space, time, coordination, and activity. So from these, I consider initiative to be the most important one, and I believe that there are two ways to master the dynamics uh, of chess, or the dynamic aspects of chess. One is to play gambits, and you might say, oh, but aren't gambits unsound? Am I not going to lose a lot of games? And, and after all, they're not at the highest level, are they? So why would, I be, why would I be playing gambits? Well, trust me, all of this is irrelevant because mastering the dynamic element of chess or the dynamic aspects of chess is absolutely fundamental to making it um, to the 2200 rating. And it's precisely this aspect of chess that the 19 to 2100 player does not understand so well or completely ignores, as um, this kind of play is more concerned with the static elements of chess, such as delivering checkmates, um, open files, weak squares, or weak color complexes, um, and other fixed visible weaknesses on the board, which are much less subtle and easy to spot. So what I would recommend when it comes to gambits is playing or starting with the Blumenfeld gambit as black, 
which is uh, relatively safe and in many cases involves all the dynamics, um, the dynamic aspects mentioned, mentioned here, which we'll go through one by one. And I'll be making recommendations as to how to improve and each and every one of them. So the Blumenfeld Gambit is truly an amazing opening and it results in sudden wins where white ends up in, in hopeless positions for an obvious reason. Um, the second way to master the dynamic aspects of chess is to study the games of the great masters of dynamic chess in the initiative like Alekheim, Botvinnik, Kasparov, Topalov, Nakamura and, and others of course. This brings us to, to the second reason or the second aspect of chess that is uh, hugely important, that is calculation. Um, calculation is extremely important uh, because without being able to calculate well you will not be able to fully master the dynamic um, aspects of chess and that is precisely why the 19 to 2100 player is not able to play dynamic chess at the level of a higher rated player um, and that is because dynamic chess involves deeper calculation um, I will do a separate video on calculation it's probably the most misunderstood aspect of chess but suffice it to say that from my experience in five or three minute blitz one needs to be able to constantly calculate four moves, uh, four move variations in a matter of 10 to 15 seconds, which is easier said than done, especially when you're down on time or in an inferior position. So we come to the next, um, the next point, which is winning technique. Now that is a, is a very obscure concept because um, there is almost nothing on winning technique in chess literature, but um, that is extremely, extremely important nevertheless. How many times did you have a winning position against a higher rated opponent you were not able to convert? Let me guess, every time, 90% of the time, something like that. It's extremely important to be able to beat higher rated opponents in order to get more rating points from a single victory on your way to the 2200 rating. And that will not be possible without a decent winning technique. Uh, because by virtue of being the better player, the 2200 plus player will find defensive resources you will not be able to overcome. Um, so why is it that um, and, and how does one improve their winning technique? If you think about it, at what stage of the game are we facing the task of converting a winning advantage? Yes, it's um, when there are less pieces on the board. So which other well-known well stage of the game would that resemble? It's the end game. Studying certain kinds of end games will improve your winning technique across all stages of the game, including the opening and the middle game. And by certain end games, I actually mean practical end games rather than the theoretical end games, which is the kind of end game that the 19 to 2100 uh, rated player is more concerned about. Um, an excellent book on, on the subject is uh, Jacob Argard's End Game Play. Uh, which contains um, mostly uh, practical endgames rather than the theoretical endgames which are either known to be certainly drawn with best play or winning with best play for one of the sides. I would also suggest you study queen and rook. I wouldn't call them endgames because there's, there's no queen and rook endgames where one of the sides has queen and rooks and the other side has queen and rooks. But um, studying this kind of practical endgames will significantly improve your winning technique. Um, I believe Jacob has, a, has an excellent chapter on this in his book, Endgame Play, so I would definitely recommend it. I would also recommend you read anything on winning advantage or technical chess and chess literature that you manage to get your hands on. Because without this aspect, there is, there is no progress in chess. It's, it's hugely important. Um, this brings us to our next um, aspect of chess, which uh, one needs to understand at, um, at a very high level in order to be the 9 to the 2100 rated player. And that is psychology. Uh, well, if the other aspects I have or will mention are not enough, the higher rated player also utilizes a whole arsenal psychological tools that will at some stage throw off 
the low rated player and they will make a mistake and lose the game. First is deception and this can be subdivided into double attacks, that is attacking two or more pieces with one move. Multi-purpose moves, um, which is a attacking a piece but at the same time defending a previously undefended piece which your opponent just tries to take two moves down the line and, and gets punished accordingly. Also concealing your intentions, keeping cheapos in reserve when the opponent is under pressure and all that. Um, we'll see how this is done during the game so I'm not going to go into further details in this. I think that is already detailed enough. Um, next we have provocation. I could have used this as part of deception but I think it, um, it needs to stand out on its own because uh, provo provocation is basically provoking weaknesses in your opponent's position by threatening obvious uh, threats which are not always relevant like checkmates or, or any, any other sort of material win which can be easily prevented and it's not, it's not immediate as such. And because your opponent does not like the idea of being under pressure, they, they feel provoked to make a weakening move around, around their king. And um, those are the four moves to say f3, g3, h3 or f6, g6, h6 uh, with a kingside castle or a3, b3, c3, a6, b6, c6 with a queenside castle. Next. Is Next is entering complications. Uh, basically, this is hugely important aspect of chess, and I cannot overemphasize how important this is, especially in blitz. In simple terms, this is the ability to create a scramble for yourself and come out on top, but by virtue of sometimes playing suboptimal moves. Um, I highly recommend starting the games of the masters of uh, complications like Bent Larsen. Viktor Korchnoi, Lubomir Lubovic and others as this is likely to win you many many games. Entering complications is also, is also related to dynamic chess or dynamic play but in contrast it does not necessarily involve um, playing objectively um, correct and sound dynamic chess. It involves playing suboptimal moves to, in order to throw your opponent off. Um, next in the, in the list of psychological weapons used by the higher rated player, we have inflicting miscoordination on your opponent's pieces. What does that mean? That means playing against certain pieces rather than having some sort of a deep uh, strategy that, that goes into, into the game. So basically you are trying to, to affect the way a piece performs in, in relation to its counterparts. And this is this is a this is a subtle concept. And um, I dare you show me a 19 or 2100 player that plays with this with this um, in mind. This is this is rarely used, and this is the kind of stuff everything here in psychology that wins you games. So I suggest you you include it in your in your repertoire repertoire of psychological tricks. It's it's hugely it's hugely important and uh, and useful. Last on the list, I mean, this I'm sure the list can be extended, but this is my list. And um, last on the list, we have pressure, and pressure is basically actively posing problems to your opponent via playing active moves and again suboptimal moves. Next on the list, we have discipline. Now, discipline could have been put as part of psychology, but um, some sort of differentiation needs to be made because when it comes to psychology, this is a psychology of playing, like um, psychology when it comes to playing chess over the board, while discipline is the kind of psychology that you should have off the board. What do I mean? Well, what does a 2200 or a 2300 player and above um, do when they lose 50 points? They stop playing. What does a 19 to 2100 player do when they lose 50 points. They keep playing, hoping they'll get it back and um, in the process they lose another 100 and this happens over and over again, day after day, month after month, year after year and it's it's just a vicious circle that the 90 to 2100 player does not have the discipline and the will to get out of. 
So the, the stronger chess player takes every game seriously and simply utilizes their resources in terms of money and time in a more efficient way. Uh, I will be doing a separate video on this subject, but suffice it to say that overplaying can keep you in the 1900s or 2000 for decades. I mean, literally decades. People have been known to have played for decades without being able to hold a 2000 rating. And um, I believe overplaying has a, has a key role in this. Now, last on the list, we have openings. And um, I deliberately listed openings as the, as the least important reason. Not because they're not important, quite the opposite, they're extremely important. But the attention that um, and the time that a 19 2100 player spends on studying openings. And maybe it's a bit unfair to include 19 2100 players here because they, they already realize to some extent that it's not the opening that's going to get them to to the 2200 rating, especially if they are 1900. But this actually, this includes a much lower rated opponents like 1600, 1700 opponents, where this is a, this is a chronicle problem, um, where these players spend on studying openings, uh, an amount of time that is disproportionate to what one needs to know about openings to make to the next rating level. Um, the lower rated player need, um, reads opening books all the time, uh, buys the latest databases and latest books on their favorite openings because they lose an incredibly high number of games to higher rated opponents in the opening. So they think, well, if I know 5 to 10 moves into my openings and I lose in the opening, my opponent must have known 15 to 25 moves into the opening. I can assure you that's not the case and I, I have not touched an opening book in 5 years. I mean, I do study opening losses. I would say a lot when I gather a significant sample of losses in one opening, but I do so mainly with a computer and I refer to theory only if I don't like um, the computer recommendations, which does not happen too often. And because of changes with theory, I have had to change two of my openings over the past five years. And, and that is not a lot. For example, I wasn't happy with the way even despite computer recommendations in theory in the lines I was playing, I wasn't happy with my repertoire against the Alakine defense, so I had to change that completely. And I also had to change um, my black repertoire against the Queen C2 Ninzo Indian defense, which again, these are not a lot of changes to make in five years, even if you're concerned with opening theory. So what does that mean? Well, studying openings, as in reading books and training videos, is important. But what most people don't know and don't realize is that the higher rated player's repertoire, in many cases, is ideas-based as opposed to move sequences-based. In other words, they know the most important ideas and play in line with these ideas and not by having memorized lots of precise moves. Um, so what their repertoire is um, is ideas based and not not uh, move sequences based. You might then ask, how come I still lose in the opening if my opponent's preparation um, is worse than mine? In the sense that, okay, let's assume that I know say ten moves, he knew five moves, or I know fifteen moves and they know ten moves. How come I still lose in the opening? It's very simple. It's because your opening knowledge and whatever plus you might get from it does not outweigh your opponent's superior understanding of the five aspects of chess I just mentioned. Um, and these are the other aspects we just talked about, which are dynamic chess, calculation, winning techniques, psychology, and discipline. Um, and, and that is because these aspects are actually applicable to every stage of the game the opening, the middle game, and the end game. And it's precisely because of that that you lose games in the opening, despite knowing um, more moves, if, if that even is the case. It's because the opening advantage is, is simply not significant enough to, to make any difference later in the game. Well, 
I think that sums it up when it comes to what I believe sets apart the stronger chess player from the weaker ones. So proceed, shall we, towards our first game, um, where we will see how the six aspects are applied in practice.